Welcome Grade Tens. Today we will be looking at the molar volume of gases. Before we start with that, let's revise the equations we have covered so far. For pure substances, we can calculate the number of moles if we know the mass and the molar mass. And for a solution, we can calculate the number of moles if we know the concentration and the volume of the solution. In this lesson, we will apply the idea of moles specifically to gases. Keke will tell us more. You should know by now that if you take a certain amount of a solid substance and heat it, the number of particles inside the sample remains the same, whether it is in solid, gas or liquid phase. This is because phase changes are physical changes, which means that it's only the way the atoms are arranged that changes. It seems logical then that the same principles that apply to the relationships between solids and moles should also apply to gases and moles. So why do we need to spend an entire lesson on gases? Well, in the real world, measuring the mass of a sample of gas is not always easy. Most often, a gas is measured by its volume, not by its mass. So for gases, we need to find a relationship between the volume of a sample of a gas and the number of moles present in the sample. To begin with, let's recap some basic ideas you should have heard of before. You should know that the air around us is a mixture of different gases. These gases work together in important global cycles to maintain the conditions that make life on Earth possible. But human activity has damaged the atmosphere through pollution. To prevent further damage, chemical factories need to find ways to lower the amount of harmful gases released into the atmosphere. In fact, today many chemists' jobs is to monitor the environmental impact of chemical factories. To do this, they need to accurately measure the amount of harmful gases found in air. But measuring gas is not as simple as measuring liquids and solids. Remember, a solid is a form of matter with a fixed shape and volume. The shape or size will not change unless you do something to it, like cut it or heat it. When heated, a solid changes to a liquid through a process called melting. The liquid that is formed no longer has its own shape, but it takes the shape of the container that it's in. This is a distinct property of liquids. Gases, on the other hand, don't only take the shape of the container that they're placed in, but a gas will fill the container completely. That's the principle on which these air fresheners work. As the liquid evaporates, the gas fills the room and pretty soon you will detect the smell of the perfume, wherever you are in the room. Let's go to the lab to watch an experiment to illustrate this idea more clearly. Hey there guys, look here. I've prepared some nitrogen dioxide in this gas jar. Now if you look at it, it's a nice brown gas filling the entire gas jar. Now I'm going to place another gas jar which is empty, over this gas jar filled with nitrogen dioxide. Remove the cover slip, and I want you to watch carefully and see what happens. Do you see that the gas is spreading out to fill both containers? The amount of gas obviously did not change, but the volume that it occupies did. This is a property that is unique to gases. These ideas about solids, liquids and gases that we've just recapped are used to formulate the kinetic theory of matter. This says, in solids, particles are close together and held in position by very strong forces. In liquids, the particles can move over each other and are not kept in rigid positions. In gases, particles spread out and fill the container that they are placed in. From these principles, it's important that you recognize that a certain number of gas molecules can be squeezed into just about any size container. But if the container is small, the gas particles are going to bump into the side of the container more often. This means that the pressure that the gas produces on the sides of the container will be high. So the volume of a gas cannot be studied without thinking about the pressure that the gas exerts too. And that's not all. Pressure can also be affected by temperature. When the temperature of the gas is increased, the particles will move faster and they'll want to occupy a greater volume. Look at this interesting experiment that explains this principle. It's quite easy and you can try it for yourself. This cold bottle contains nothing but air. If we now place a balloon that's half filled with air over the top, I'm sure you'll agree that the amount of gas in the balloon and bottle together will stay the same because it cannot escape. Watch what happens when we heat the gas in the bottle by placing it in hot water. 
Do you see that the balloon is inflating? The volume of the balloon is increasing because we have increased the temperature. The number of gas particles did not increase, but the volume did. Nice, eh? Now, earlier in this series, we talked about a scientist, Avogadro, who put forward a theory about gases. Can you still remember what he said? Avogadro's principle states that equal volumes of all gases contain an equal number of particles under the same conditions of temperature and pressure. It's important to understand that this rule is true for all gases. If I showed you a gas cylinder filled with helium gas and a gas cylinder filled with oxygen gas, what conclusion do you think we could make about the number of particles in each cylinder? That's it. By applying Avogadro's principle, we could say that if these gases are at the same pressure and temperature, there will be the same number of gas particles in each cylinder. So for gases, it would really be useful if we could find the specific volume of gas that represents one mole. But we could not just choose any volume under any conditions. We would have to include a standard temperature and pressure in our relationship. In science, we abbreviate the term standard temperature and pressure to STP. Scientists decided that the value of STP will be a temperature of 0 degrees Celsius and a pressure of 101,3 kilopascal. Now, all we need is the volume one mole of gas will occupy under these conditions. Can you suggest how scientists would know what the volume of exactly one mole of any gas would be? That's it. They had to weigh out the molar masses of a lot of different gases in grams at STP and then compared the volumes that one mole of the different gases occupied at STP. Remember, one mole of a substance is its molar mass in grams. Using sophisticated scales and equipment and making sure that the temperature and pressure were at standard conditions, scientists discovered that one mole of any gas has a volume of 22,4 decimeters cubed. This means that this box, which has a volume of 22,4 decimeters cubed, would contain one mole of any gas at STP. I'm sure you'll agree that this is quite a large volume if you compare it to one mole of water, which is a liquid, or one mole of carbon, which is a solid. What do you think this tells us about the arrangement of molecules in the gas phase? Yes, the particles of a gas are actually very far apart from each other. Remember that all these samples contain the same number of particles, one mole. Now, we give this volume of one mole of gas at STP a special symbol, Vm. So, in the same way that we have a relationship for moles and mass, and moles and number, we can now write a relationship for moles and volume at STP. N equals V divided by Vm, number of moles is equal to volume of the sample divided by volume of one mole or 22,4 decimeters cubed. Thank you, Keke. So scientists have proved to us that one mole of gas will always have the same volume under certain conditions. One mole of any gas occupies a volume of 22,4 decimeters cubed at STP. STP stands for standard temperature and pressure. Standard temperature is zero degrees Celsius. Standard pressure is the pressure of one atmosphere, which is 101,3 kilopascals. Let's try a few examples together. What volume would a 0,5 gram sample of hydrogen gas occupy at STP? It's always easiest to start with the number of moles, so let's convert from mass to moles by making use of the equation. Number of moles is equal to mass divided by molar mass. Remember that hydrogen gas consists of diatomic molecules, so the molar mass of the molecule is 2 grams per mole. We substitute the mass of 0,5 gram and the molar mass of 2 gram per mole we find that there are 0,25 moles present in the sample of hydrogen gas. Now we will use this value to calculate the volume of gas under conditions of standard temperature and pressure. 
Our standard formula is the number of moles is equal to the volume of the sample divided by the molar volume. We substitute the number of moles from our previous answer of 0, 0,25 and the molar volume at STP, which is 22,4 decimeters cubed. We change the subject of the formula so that the volume is 0, 0,25 multiplied by 22,4. This gives us a final answer of 5,60 cubic decimeters at STP. Let's do one more example together. In this one, we are given the volume of an unknown gas at STP. And with the help of calculations, we have to identify this gas. 14 grams of an unknown gas occupies a volume of 11,2 cubic decimeters at STP. Make use of calculations to identify this unknown gas. One way that we can identify elements and compounds is by making use of the molar mass of that element or compound. So, if we interpret this question correctly, we need to calculate the molar mass of the unknown gas. We write down our standard formula for the relationship between the number of moles, volume, and molar volume. We want to calculate the molar mass. We can substitute the number of moles with the equation mass over molar mass. We can also substitute the value of the molar volume at STP, which is 22,4. The mass of the gas is 14 grams and the volume is 11,2 decimeters cubed. Now we need to change the formula around so that the molar mass is the subject of the formula. We then find that the molar mass is 14 times 22,4 divided by 11,2. And we get an answer of 28 grams per mole. We still need to identify the gas. Let's look at the periodic table to see which element has an atomic mass of 28. According to the periodic table, we see that Si, which is silicon, has a molar mass of 28 grams per mole. But silicon is not a gas at STP. It is a solid. We must remember that most of the lighter gases are diatomic gases, which means that there are two of the same type of atoms in the molecule. Taking our answer of 28 grams per mole and dividing it by 2 gives us a molar mass of 14. Let's go back to the periodic table again so that we can identify the unknown gas. Do you see that nitrogen has a mass of 14 grams per mole? Is nitrogen a gas at STP? Yes, it is. And is it a diatomic molecule? Yes, again. So, we have positively identified our unknown gas as nitrogen gas. We have now investigated all the possible ways to calculate the number of moles of a substance. In our next lesson, we will apply this knowledge to do some more stoichiometric calculations. Goodbye, grade 10s.